Fabulous. Thank you all for joining in to this session of Biodiversity Genomics Academy. We have Katharina Hoff going to tell us everything she knows about Breaker 3 and gene prediction. Over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction and all the organization. And of course, thank you that you joined the session today. So my mission today is to talk to you about my favorite research topic, which is structural genome annotation in eukaryotes. And I always like to have the heads up of what's going to happen next. So the plan for today that I have in mind is that I will first soon start the screen sharing and uh, basically give you a small talk, a small lecture on Breaker, a little bit of historic perspective, a little bit on outlook and how bad or well it works under which conditions <laughs> mostly well i hope um, and then afterwards uh, we will stop that and we will move on to gitpod um, for a practical hands-on session um, this is a big challenge the hands-on session because computational time for this kind of task is pretty large um, this morning i actually went to a smaller data set again to make it a bit faster um, i will explain all that later but we will probably mostly look at pre-computed results while a job is running because otherwise i mean you can also choose to collectively say we all want to have a coffee break now but uh, maybe we will just stick to looking at data that's already there um, I don't mind if you like intercept me by unmuting yourselves to ask questions. You also have the option to go to um, Discord. I have that here as well, but uh, Sujai will help me um, to keep track of that if you want to type your questions. Um, and also let me know if I'm going too fast. If you didn't get something like questions on this are not stupid. Sometimes maybe I don't speak clearly. Um, usually if it would be a longer workshop, I would invite all of you to introduce yourselves, but today we will skip this um, also because it's recorded and maybe you don't want to have that recorded, uh, but uh, be aware I appreciate all of you being here. Okay, I will start the technical challenge of trying to share my screen, which we have rehearsed, so there is a good chance it may work. <laughs> Okay, so um, you do not have to uh, screenshot the slides, you have access to the slides, okay, they are in a GitHub repository, you find the link uh, in the Zoom chat, um, so of course taking notes of things that are important to you makes sense probably, um, but I just want to let you know that the slides are public and they will also remain public. So the workshop is mainly on structural genome annotation with Breaker 3, which is a fully annotated pipeline for structural genome annotation. I will also briefly talk about GALBA because under certain circumstances that might be mm, a better choice. It's kind of a sister pipeline of the Breaker pipeline. And I know there are a lot of BGA workshops, for example, there are other workshops on genome browsers, on Busco, on Allmark. So I will not talk about how to use these tools. You have a chance to attend the other sessions, but I will tell you how these uh, tools are important uh, for structural genome annotation. Um, okay. Quick interruption. I think I'm showing up on your screen as well. So if you could... Hmm. How can I move you away? Uh, I think just make ah, it... Yeah, you're gone now. <laughs> now I don't see you. <laughs> I'm there, I'm there. I'm nodding along happily. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so let's start with what I mean with structural genome annotation. This beautiful image is from Wikipedia. I didn't make that. So what it shows you on the top is basically the genome, yeah, DNA sequence. And it depicts basically the structural features that are associated with protein coding genes in eukaryotes. For me, most importantly, these features are the protein coding exons, the coding sequences. They are shown here in red. When an mRNA is transcribed from the genome, then usually that means all these coding parts are transcribed and they are flanked by something called the untranslated region, the upstream and downstream region. Sometimes UTR annotation is mm, a topic in genome annotation, but will not be today. Um, it's actually a very difficult task to do this accurately, and our group is not so good at doing a good job on that, so we'll, we'll skip the UTR prediction today. Um, important to note in the eukaryotic gene structures is that there are also these gray parts, they are the introns. And these introns, they are on the genome, they will be in the transcribed mRNA initially, but then a process called splicing takes place, and these gray parts are basically excised, they're 
discarded. Maybe they do regularly regulatory stuff in the cell, but um, we don't see them anymore when later the coding sequence that has been spliced is translated into a protein. Of course, there are other structural features in the genome that have regulatory functions, for example, a promoter or enhancers and silencers that can be close or distant. Um, we're not looking at annotating these. We're today talking about annotating basically these red parts, like from start codon to stop codon, including all the introns on the genome level. Now, thinking about how could we get there? Um, what information can we actually use one important part of information has for a long time been and still is some kind of mathematical model that can be applied to the genome sequence. So traditionally in this field of research, we have been working a lot with hidden Markov models, for example, generalized hidden Markov models. That is not saying that hidden Markov models are the only ground truth. It can be different models. A lot has been tried. Most recently, it looks promising to use LSTMs in combination with the hidden Markov model. Uh, it's a tool called Helixer out there now. But the methods I will describe today, they use generalized hidden Markov models under the hood. So there is a mathematical model. Those models, they, um, they need to be designed. They have parameters. Um, parameters need to be adjusted to make it work well. And then also, we can actually um, sequence this uh, mRNA, ideally the mature mRNA. Yeah? So we can monitor transcription experimentally. And if we have monitored this, we can map it back to the genome. So this kind of projection of monitored transcription data can also help us to find eukaryotic gene structures. However, if we map, you see here this uh, mature mRNA, if you map that back to the genome, you see it will also include the UTR part. Um, and we actually want to know where the start codon and the stop codon of a gene is. So it's not a very trivial thing. Uh, mRNA doesn't give you information on reading frames. And then there is another part that is very commonly used for finding gene structures. And those are proteins of relatives, like species that are either remotely or very closely related to your target genome. You can take their protein set, if it is known, and try to splice a line that to the genome in order to infer gene structures that will probably look very similar to that related species gene structures. Um, there are other informations that can be used. For example, uh, you could use um, homology of genomes uh, to one another, but this is something we're not covering today. Okay. I don't want to later go into how exactly a hidden Markov model works, but I want to outline which signals are important for finding protein coding gene structures. Uh, and these are basically exactly the same signals that if you come from biology, you have learned in a, your molecular, molecular biology class, ideally at some point in time in your life. So there are signals that make the cell recognize where to start transcription and where to terminate transcription. There are signals that tell the ribosome where to start translation, where to end translation. There are signals that tell the cell how to splice their donor splice sites, acceptor splice sites, branch point regions. These signals, um, I think they're pretty easy to understand. Yeah, there's an idea, it works in biology and the cell, so we can try to learn that somehow with a model. There is another thing to consider, and that is for a living organism, it is probably vital that the proteins function. If you have mutations in genes that code for proteins, something could go horribly wrong. Therefore, the mutation rate in coding sequences is usually much lower than in non-coding sequences. Um, so you can also exploit that, and that's usually done by using position unspecific frequencies of nucleotide, nucleotide patterns, for example, hexanucleotide frequencies. Now, if you apply this concept to a stretch of DNA, you can make an educated guess whether the stretch is rather coding or non-coding. The bad news is that even though the signals and the sequence content is kind of a universal concept, it varies between species and it varies substantially. We're today going to talk about pipelines that are designed to annotate an individual novel genome. And the problem is that usually if you want to annotate an individual novel genome, you have not seen the gene structures of that individual novel genome before. 
it's a slightly different story if you're sequencing another Drosophila melanogaster strain. Yeah, there's a reference annotation, but we're talking about de novo annotation of species where we have no information. So we need to find out first how all these signals work in a species before we can annotate it well. It's kind of a chicken egg problem. Yeah, you have species specific parameters that need training, but for this, usually you need training examples. And this is the problem that we try to solve. So just to, to make it very clear what is our input and our output in the structural genome annotation problem, the minimal input would be the genome assembly. In many of our pipelines, we will additionally have as input extrinsic evidence, either short read RNA sec alignments or large database of protein sequences or a small set of protein sequences. And the output for us is basically a table. It's a table that lists for this sequence at that coordinate, a feature starts. It's, for example, a coding sequence feature. It ends at another coordinate on the plus trend. And we give this transcript a name so that we can group together the CDS that belong together. Uh, this information is commonly stored in GFF or GTF or GFF3 format. There are different flavors of the same kind of table outline. To visualize this more graphically, so the genome is not shown here, but the evidence is shown. What we show here in blue are, for example, spliced alignments of protein sequences to a genome. You see that by spliced alignment, there have been those lines introduced. They basically reflect gaps in the alignment or introns, hopefully. We have a few RNA-seq read alignments depicted here. They don't all have to have gaps, but in this example, they have. And what we will do with that information and the genome sequence and the mathematical model in the background is to predict genes. And with Augustus, which is under the hood of Breaker and of Galva, we will probably, if the evidence allows, predict alternative transcripts of the same gene. This is shown in red here. However, it's very important to know that this is still only a prediction, even if it's evidence supported, the ground truth might be different. As you see in black here at the top, Yeah, there might be a ground truth that is still not what we can achieve, but we're trying to get there. Okay. Um, quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, it was a little test to see if you could see my raised hand. Um, how, why is the RNA-seq alignment not going all the way through? Yeah, so there are different technologies to sequence RNA. Um, the technology that our pipelines work with is a short read sequencing. Uh, so read length in the beginning were like 35 base pairs. Now we are more at 300 base pairs, but the average eukaryotic gene structure is a bit longer than 300 base pairs. And that's why when we align the raw reads to the genome, it, it looks kind of like a, like, yeah, like I show here. <laughs> There is another question, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Finally, I had a lot of problems with my microphone and I wasn't sure. Uh, so um, you said that it's possible to make the gene prediction only with the genome, with the sequence of the genome, mm -hmm. without the RNA, right? Mm -hmm. If it is a de novo assembly of a strain that is not a, a model, model uh, like a, a reference genome, is it better to do it without RNA or using like the RNA from an individual that is closely related? Mm, it is always... If you don't have if you don't have access, of course, to RNA sequence. Yeah, you cannot do the RNA seq. I get that. So um, you can do it with the genome sequence only, but the quality will be very bad. <laughs> the okay. accuracy dropped okay. significantly. Uh, I think I have a slide later where I can show that. I'll try to remember to point it out specifically. I hope I didn't take that data point out. Um, but mm, the RNA-seq of the related species may not help that much. You can try. You can, And if you try, you may want to play with the parameters of the aligner because you can allow more mismatches. It takes a bit more runtime then, and then it aligns better. Uh, particularly with Breaker 3, we have had some poor experience with cross-species RNA-seq. For Breaker 1, it kind of works. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add that if you have no RNA-seq data uh, for the target species, um, you may have proteins for your clade. 
um, I don't know, you're looking at an alveolata genome, for example, you have no RNA-seq, but there have been alveolata sequenced before and they have been annotated before. And using these proteins may be very valuable. Okay, and what, but what in the case uh, in which I have like a strain, a different strain of the same species, for example, like a different, well, I work with plants, so if I have a different cultivar of the same species, uh, then for which I can have... Shouldn't use breaker or galba then. You can, it works, but um, mm -hmm. there are special tools for uh, mapping over genome annotations that already exist. Like if it's a different strain of something that has already been annotated, uh, you can use something like TransMap, for example, or even mm -hmm. Augustus CGP, which is a comparative Augustus, can also be used to uh, map over annotations, but I think they are easier tools. Okay, thank you so much. Good. Um, hey, yeah, coming back to the problem. The problem with the statistical models that are in the gene finders is that these models need to learn how all the signals look like in a species. And this is my favorite chicken. She passed away five days ago. Her name was Bianca. She lived in my mom's garden and that was one of her real eggs. It looks unreal, but it's very real. So we have this chicken egg problem between parameter training and gene prediction. And this is basically what we solve with our pipelines. Uh, we um, solve the problem that gene finders need training examples. And today I will talk about Breaker, Galba, and Zebra. Now, when I talk about Breaker, um, I'm not the only developer and brain behind Breaker. Breaker is an international team effort. Um, it's mainly conducted between University of Greifswald which is where I'm located. It's a beautiful small town in the northeast of Germany, very old and traditional university. And uh, the team at Georgia Tech University, headed by Mark Bordowski. And back in the day when the photo was taken, Tomasz was also at Georgia Tech. He recently moved uh, to the JTI and Alex is still at Georgia Tech. Um, and also over the years, a number of our students and PhD students have been involved. And also the scientific community, the open source developers and GitHub have from time to time, um, like fixed something in the code, contributed something. So there are probably more names that should be on this slide. This is also saying that if it's, breaker code and not, not code of all the subcomponents, uh, you're very welcome to join us in enhancing it. Okay, I know you're here because you want to learn about breaker three, but I want to talk about all the breaker pipelines that we have because breaker three is a little bit fragile sometimes. We already touched on that. So let's start with the first breaker pipeline that we made, uh, which was the breaker one pipeline. The and this is not uh, the picture of the Breaker 1 pipeline of how it was published back then. This is how the Breaker 1 pipeline works today. It has been a little bit improved. Um, the key idea of Breaker 1 was in 2005 that back then the transcriptome assembly of the short read data didn't work so well, not as well as today. So we decided not to use any transcriptome assembly, but instead, if you have short read RNA-seq data, we would say, do a mapping to the genome with a spliced aligner. Today you can use HiSet2 or you can use STAR, for example. And we will only look at the splicing junctions. So in Breaker 1, only splicing junctions from RNA-seq go into a software called GeneMark ET together with your genome. The really cool thing is that the team at Georgia Tech years ago made a self-training hidden Markov model, which is something usually not heard of. It's pretty rare. And to my knowledge, until today, the only tool of that kind uh, for a genome annotation. So GeneMark ET is a self-training hidden Markov model-based gene finder. And it can use spliced alignment information from RNA-seq in order to enhance its model uh, development, like an iterative retraining. However, the gene set that GeneMark ET will output is not of the super highest accuracy. Yeah, it's decent, but it's not perfect. Uh, so we take this gene set and we filter it, and then we train our gene finder that's in our group, which is called Augustus. Augustus needs training genes. There is no way to do unsupervised training of Augustus. So we need the GeneMark gene set to make this work. And then we will predict genes with Augustus after training using the spliced alignment information from RNA-seq. 
And nowadays, we take the best genes from the gene marked gene set and throw them on top of the Augustus genes with something called Zebra, the transcript selector for Breaker, and then you get your final output. So that was our first approach to solving the problem. And I still recommend using that, like at least try it if Breaker 3 fails, which may particularly be the case if you have cross species RNA sect mappings. That said, also breaker one needs a certain amount of RNA-seq data. Just keep that in mind. It may also fail if you don't have enough data. This is how GeneMark ET is using the RNA-seq information. So what I show you here at the top with these weird uh, triangle-like thingies, um, these are basically the alignment, uh, um, the, the gaps in the alignment. These are spliced junctions inferred from RNA-seq data. And that's really the only thing that is used here. And this is only used during training set selection in GeneMark ET. They don't use this information during gene prediction. They also cannot predict alternative transcripts. Like here you have an example that would be alternative transcript, but GeneMark ET cannot do that. But it's unsupervised training, which is really amazing. So you can do it with a novel genome where you have never seen a gene structure before. Um, and it doesn't require enough material for transcriptome assembly. So you need a certain coverage. You need a large number of introns with a coverage of more than 10, uh, but you don't have to have enough data to get full transcripts assembled. Augustus then in the pipeline later takes the same information, but Augustus can use this during gene prediction and Augustus can in particular predict alternative transcript isoforms if there is such evidence provided as shown here. And Augustus can be trained now because we have the gene mark predictions, right? Now, in terms of accuracy, I will later also show you some real data, but to give you ballpark numbers, where is Breaker 1 working how well? Generally, it's a pipeline for small and medium-sized genomes. Breaker 1 is not a pipeline to be applied to the human genome. Yeah, not, not, not for large vertebrates. It will work fine on something up to like, from, from my gut, I would say 600, 800 MB genome size, not more. And the accuracy that you can expect is according to our experiments, always look at the feet of the cartoon characters somewhere around the 30 to 45% on gene level. Yeah, so if we take an average of sensitivity and specificity on gene level, um, by comparing model organism predictions to model organism annotations, this is where we end up. In large genomes, it will just die. <laughs> then a few years later, we published Breaker 2. So Breaker 2 was designed for the case where you have absolutely no RNA-seq data. So this is a pipeline that works with input of protein sequences. But all of the pipelines that I'm aware of that came before Breaker 2 and that use protein sequences at input, they wanted or needed proteins that are closely related to your species. Yeah, you could maybe do something like uh, Drosophila melanogaster um, annotation with Drosophila pseudonana or ananase might even not work so well anymore. Our idea was to have a very robust pipeline. So you don't have to have seen close relatives before. Instead, if you're working on an insect, we say you can take the, I don't know, orthodb arthropoda clade, for example, plug it in, and it doesn't really matter how close your species is to all the representatives in the database. This protein evidence will be used in a very good way to provide a high quality annotation. So this thing up here, the input proteins file, it's uh, not a small file, it's a large file. It should be in the gigabase range of file size. You don't have to use OR3DB, even though I recommend that, but you also cannot use something like Uniprot. So Uniprot is a protein database that maybe many of you have worked with before, but they try to remove sequence redundancy from Uniprot. But we need sequence redundancy to run Breaker 2. Just be aware of that. So OrthoDB is a good idea. Eggnog would also work, for example. I wouldn't recommend putting in eukaryotic, uh, all eukaryotic proteins from NCBI because that will just increase runtime a lot. So partition your database a little bit. So the tool that's sitting in there is called GeneMark EP+. 
Um, and this is basically a successor of GeneMark ET. It's again a self training gene finder that can use the protein data together with the genome data for training. In this case, they also use the protein data for gene prediction to refine their predictions. However, it still makes a lot of sense to add the Augustus training and prediction step on top, not only because of the alternative transcript prediction, which GeneMark until today cannot do properly, um, but also the accuracy of Augustus adds a lot of value here. And we do the same thing as in Breaker 1 today. We take the best GeneMark EP plus predictions and combine them with Augustus with Zebra to get the best gene set. So this is a pipeline that you can use, for example, if you're working on algal genomes. There are a lot of projects that I'm aware of uh, where there's no RNA-seq data because the algal genomes come from the environment and they had trouble isolating or nobody thought about doing poly A selection RNA-seq. Um, but there is enough algal data in OrthoDB in order to annotate the algal genome. It doesn't only work for algal, but this is an example where the genomes are not so large. Um, um, this here is, sorry, oh, is the question? question. Yeah, two questions. One is, why does the size matter for breaker one? Like, why does it fall over after 600 or 800 MB? Same as in breaker two. Um, the problem <laughs> is that GeneMark in these two versions cannot handle large repeats very well. They changed that. In Breaker 3, it's different. Um, but GeneMark would just pretty unpredictably die in large genomes that have a lot of repeats. Okay. And the second question is, how do you decide the best GeneMark GTF prediction? Like, because you said we take the best ones and move them through Zebra. Yeah, so the, um, according to evidence. That. So we have the protein to genome alignments, and basically we overlay uh, these with the predictions. And then we just decide there's so much evidence for these gene structures. Let's keep them, even if Augustus doesn't predict them. Got it. Thank you. OK. So this probably slightly complicated figure is supposed to show you how GeneMark EP Plus and Augustus use the evidence during gene prediction. I know, this is a bad one. So at the very top, you see we have protein sequences. The blue bars are protein sequences that haven't been aligned to the genome yet. But then we align them, and again, we get like splicing information. You see that here. There are those triangle structures again. But from protein to genome alignment, we can also infer start codons and stop codons. Not every aligned start codon and inferred stop codon is of high quality. So we actually have some rigorous filtering here. The HC stands for high quality. So we're only keeping the very reliable start and stop codons as evidence. And then you see in green down here that because it's protein information, we can get reading frame information for the coding exons. Yeah? So we can use that information, basically the complete coding sequence information from the alignment um, for gene prediction in Augustus later. So the splicing information, the intron information is used both in GeneMark EP and Augustus. The high quality start and stop codons are used by both GeneMark EP and Augustus, but only Augustus uses the chaining information. We call it chaining information because it basically tells the software which CDS exons of possibly many other combinations belong together. It kind of enhances the probability of predicting the right ones. So now GeneMark EP Plus also uses evidence in gene prediction, and they do something very particular shown here with a red arrow. Basically, they correct the start codon positions if there is evidence for a start codon. Yeah, they can move that around a little bit. Also, they can uh, correct uh, the intron um, positions if there is high quality uh, or high confidence intron information. So they only do those small, I would say, wiggling of positions things. Um, Augustus uh, basically intrinsically does the same uh, and additionally also predicts alternative transcript isoforms. And there are a number of tiny differences between those two tools. So they usually do not predict exactly the same gene set. So it has value to combine them also because of that. Again, ballpark numbers, breaker two gene prediction accuracy, if you use 
or CDB as protein donors. And if you have no close relatives in there, yeah? So we did simulations where we excluded all the close relatives from OrthoDB. Um, if that is the case, then in small and medium-sized genomes, you end up in kind of the same, maybe a little bit better um, accuracy range uh, than with BRCA1. Yeah, so sometimes BRCA1 is a little better. Most times BRCA2 is a tiny little bit better than BRCA1. If you have proteins of closely related species in your protein database, then this looks better. Yeah, then you can move up the staircase here to maybe the 60%. So it is worth putting in proteins of close relatives in addition to distant relatives. Now, I mentioned twice already Zebra, the transcript selector for breaker. Um, we figured after we had made BRCA1 and BRCA2 that combining these two gene sets may make a lot of sense, but we had trouble to find a software to do that in a way that fits to our using of intron information. There are many other combiners. Um, one that is highly popular is Evidence Modeler. And I strongly recommend that if you dive into structural genome annotation, check out Evidence Modeler too. Um, but Evidence Modeler is not a good combiner for breaker specifically because they don't use intron information. And we do that a lot. Um, so the key idea is that if you look at the intersection of breaker one and breaker two, you probably have a highly reliable gene set, but we also want to find these that are probably very reliable from each of the breaker one and breaker two gene sets separately. And we want to do that in a way that we decrease false positive predictions by hopefully not losing a lot of sensitivity. And our judge of what is a good gene structure is evidence. So again, RNA-sec to genome alignments, protein to genome alignments. So the idea is to run breaker one and breaker two, combine them and increase accuracy. Um, uh, quick question, just yes. because it seems like, oh, no, actually, this slide answers at least one question. Um, so uh, how do GeneMark and Breaker deal with large intron sizes? Yeah, there is a limit. <laughs> the limit is not uh, in GeneMark and Augustus usually. The limit is usually with the RNA-seq aligners or with the aligners altogether. Um, so I know that people who, for example, annotate tree genomes, not all tree genomes, but some tree genomes, they have huge introns and it's a problem to get, for example, the transcriptome alignment to cover that intron because the uh, alignment tools have limits there. Um, at some point in time, I think also Augustus will mm, not be able to incorporate the information anymore, but it's not, to my knowledge, not a hard-coded threshold, not a parameter that you can change easily, but there are limitations with very long introns, uh, more limitations in GeneMark than in Augustus, certainly. So the follow-up question to that was, can you configure the pipeline for different intron sizes, even if it's not at the upper, upper limit, I guess? Um, if, if you have, for example, plant genomes that have long introns, maybe check out the easel pipeline, uh, because I know that uh, the team of Jill Wagerson, they have spent a lot of hours on like thinking about exactly this problem. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how the accuracy of easel is, like I have not benchmarked it here thought about it, ran out of time, um, but they may have answers to that question. And if you cannot find it in the easel code, maybe ask them what they do in these genomes. In fact, next week, there are two easel sessions. Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, attend these. <laughs> I yes. thought about it myself, but I have other obligations, sadly. <laughs> we need to do the recording, obviously. Um, my, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can see that. Would you prefer it if I read out the questions? Or uh, you... I can probably unlock No, no, I'm happy to read them out. That's fine. So can <laughs> Breaker 2 also use RNA-seq? Because on this slide, it says Breaker 2 is protein only. No, so, okay, there has been a, a very big confusion created by dispute within our team. <laughs> I must start with that. So um, the idea of making Breaker 2, which is protein only, um, was born already before we published Breaker 1. And then I was waiting for the development of GeneMark EP for several years. And during those years, I made various flavors of the Breaker 1 pipeline that can take both RNA-seq and protein evidence. And some people think that is Breaker 2. It was not published as Breaker 2. <laughs> um, but um, Breaker can do a lot of things, and some of them are stupid. In Breaker 3, we actually try to take out all the pipelines that are not achieving high accuracy. So 
If you use the current version of Breaker, then if you run Breaker 2, it takes protein sequence only. But there is a book chapter called Whole Genome Annotation with Breaker that depicts a wide range of different pipelines that we took out of our code intentionally. <laughs> okay. And the last question for now is uh, the choice of the version of Breaker depends on, does the choice of the version of Breaker depend on the availability of relative species and the size of our genome? I feel uh, like yes, um, it does. Um, if you have a large genome, like a vertebrate genome, I would say if Breaker 3 doesn't work, you can try Breaker 1 and Breaker 2, but it will likely not work either. So for large genomes, Vertebrate genomes, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are a poor choice. Um, altogether, you can say if you have both like RNA-seq and protein data, always try to use both. Whether you do that in BRCA3 that natively takes both or whether you do that by combining BRCA1 and BRCA2 in a small or medium-sized genome, um, it helps to use as much information as you can get. Uh, last question, is it possible to use Zebra with Breaker 3? Yes, Zebra uses, is in Breaker 3, like it's in there. <laughs> and just to check, I know people are typing in Discord, which is great, and I'm sort of pausing to collect three or four questions at a time to do it. But do people, people should feel, I mean, Catherine has already said, people should feel free to raise their hands or unmute. Uh, last question for now, what to use in case of large genomes? Oh, which you're probably answering anyway. <laughs> yeah, so in case of large genomes, try BRCA3 or GALBA. <laughs> That's why we cover GALBA. <laughs> okay, good. So to give you an idea of um, how much it helps to use the combination of BRCA2 and BRCA1 with Zebra, you see in this picture here, I still have Mm, the ballpark, a cursive figure, uh, cartoon character, like a shadow, where we were before. And if you combine two of such gene sets with the evidence with zebra, you basically move up the stairway. Again, um, this is if you have no close relative proteins in the database. If you have the close relatives, the beautiful superhero might work a little bit further up the stairs. Okay. Now, we come to the point that most of you probably joined the session for, and I'm sorry that you kept you waiting for so long. Uh, so we want to get to the top of the ladder, the top of the stairs, right? We want to reach with our hand the 100%. We are not there yet. Um, but look at the, sh at the foot. Like uh, the foot that is highest on the ladder is climbing between the 70 and the 80% accuracy. And this is where we are right now with Breaker 3. And Breaker 3 is a pipeline for genomes of all sizes. It will also work on large genomes. Don't try the mistletoe. I mean, you can try, but the mistletoe is extreme. If I say um, all genome sizes, I, I mean what we are usually used to, like two gigabyte are not a problem, okay? <laughs> um, and it needs RNA-seq data, and it needs a database of proteins, large database. And RNA-seq data, it needs a substantial amount of short read RNA-seq data, just to keep that in mind. So this is the outline of our latest breaker pipeline. It takes as input the RNA-seq, the genome, and the protein database. When I say RNA-seq, I mean short read data. I'm not talking about PEC biodata. Yeah? Um, in design, it should work with long read data, but we, we have simply not tested it for you. I know people have tried to test it and there are some hiccups. <laughs> um, so short read data. Um, protein file, again, should be a large database. There is no harm including close relatives. You should if you have them, um, but you can also do it with an OrthoDB uh, partition that is rather remotely related to your target species uh, overall. Um, the GeneMark flavor that is used in here is called GeneMark ETP, and it works very differently from the GeneMark versions that were in Breaker 1 and Breaker 2. This is also how we get to, um, like, really this big jump in accuracy and to processing large genomes. I will show you a little bit more on that on the next slide. The key idea, however, remains the same. Yeah, we predict genes with GeneMark ETP, use them for training Augustus, and then combine the two gene sets with zebra, that was the question, whether that happens. The most important difference under the hood is that since 2000, 
13 when I started on Breaker 1. I mean, published it was later, but I started. Uh, until now, there was a huge development in fast and accurate transcriptome assemblers. So Breaker 3 under the hood uses splice aligned and assembled RNA-seq data. So genome guided assembled RNA-seq data. Um, we use the string tie to um, assembler here. Um, yes. Uh, our preprint that is shown on the slide is under peer review and we're like working on the resubmission. It's one of the many Zoom calls today. <laughs> okay. So this is the promised, very confusing slide on what's happening under the hood in Breaker 3. Um, let's first not look at the shaded yellow stuff. <laughs> let's look at the really yellow inputs. Yeah, we have these input files. And at first, the genome file and the spliced aligned BAM file that has the RNA-seq uh, alignment information is assembled with string tie. That happens within GeneMark ETP. And then we use another self-training version of GeneMark that is basically derived from a prokaryotic gene finder. GeneMark ST is a tool for predicting ORFs in transcripts eukaryotic transcripts, and it also have this, has the self-training uh, part that all the other GeneMark tools have. So basically, there is a self-training and prediction step that's taking place in the assembled transcripts. And from these predicted genes in the assembled transcripts, a training gene set is formed for GeneMark training, which is then performed. When you do it this way, there are some transcripts where GeneMark ST will predict a gene that are virtually impossible to predict um, by the eukaryotic GeneMark or by Augustus. Uh, like there can be some, some very weird things like super short exons and stuff like that. And we are able to capture these gene structures with GeneMark ST predictions. And they are, it's not really shown here, but they are just piped through. So we're keeping gene structures that are reliable and otherwise impossible to find from this step. You see the protein database also goes in. The problem is that the GeneMark ST prediction is very poor. <laughs> It has a lot of false positives. So we use a large database of protein sequences to denoise the gene mark ST predictions in the transcripts. Yeah, so it, like false positives are discarded that way. That's how the training set for gene mark becomes very accurate. And that's why the training then works very well. Um, so gene mark. Uh, outputs a number of files, in our case also the hints file that is used for Augustus and for Zebra. That's basically the evidence file. It contains all the um, yeah, features that are supported by RNA-seq and the protein database. It also produces its own gene set, which is on its own quite good. I will show you a slide on that. And training genes for Augustus, which are like the best of the best of gene mark predictions as usual. So then we predict genes with Augustus after training, and we combine um, the training gene set, which is a super good gene set, so we enforce that with Zebra together with all the predictions from GeneMark and the Augustus gene set and the evidence, and get to the final gene set that is basically produced by Zebra. Okay. Mm. It is kind of hard to say what happens in a novel genome when you apply a gene finder. So we are not using novel genomes to show you how well our pipelines work, but we use, we call them model genomes that have undergone annotation efforts for many, many years. So um, for the small genomes here, these are three rather small genomes. We have Arabidopsis thaliana, C. elegans, D. melanogaster. Yeah, so we have a plant, a worm, a nematode, uh, and an insect in here. Um, you see the genome sizes are 100 to 140 MB, rather small. This works for BRCA1 and BRCA2 as well. Um, and the genes that we are using in the reference annotation, the number is shown here, they are between 13,000 and about 27,000. And then we also have three large genomes we'll look at today, the chicken, the mouse, and the tomato, one large plant included, but yeah. It's not that large, but in our definition, it's large. Um, you see they have sizes from 700 to uh, 2.6 gigabyte, uh, 700 MB to 2.6 gigabyte, and they also have a reference annotation set. The accuracy values that I will show you next, um, the field has kind of its own standards. Sensitivity is pretty universal also with the machine learning crowd. So sensitivity means the percentage of correctly found features 
in some reference. In our case, the features can be genes, like ranging from start codon over uh, splice sites to stop codon, like the complete thing. Or the feature can be transcripts. So we even like tell apart the different transcript isoforms or a feature, the easiest thing would be a coding exon. Yeah, that's much easier to predict than chaining it all together correctly. Um, and our reference is like the reference genome annotation from the table up here. The specificity definition is a bit different from what machine learners usually have in mind. Um, for us, the specificity is the percentage of correctly found features in the predicted set. And in the figures that I'm going to show you next, you have like the sensitivity on one axis, specificity on the other axis. But whenever we want to like on average compare things, we average and we do this with the harmonic mean. And that's what we call F1. Again, machine learners may disagree. Okay. So first I want to show you accuracy in small genomes like the C. elegans, um, Diamalogaster and Ataliana. Um, for these experiments, we picked some to like our human eye attractively looking Illumina libraries on the sequence read archive. So they were handpicked here. Um, and we took OrthoDB version 10 for the respective clade and we threw out all the proteins um, of the close relatives. So everything on order level is excluded here. If you would keep this, accuracy would increase, okay? But this is to simulate that your novel genome has no close relatives. And then what we show you in, in the plots here is first the accuracy on gene level, then on transcript level, that's more difficult than gene level, and on exon level, which is not so difficult. Huh? Um, in light, light blue and in brownish, you see the breaker one and the breaker two accuracy. Yeah, on gene level and on transcript level, you see they're very similar and they are lower than the other points. If you combine these two with zebra, then accuracy moves up. Yeah, this is why I took the time to explain to you that this might be a valuable approach. Then we show you the accuracy of gene mark ETP outside of breaker three. Yeah, ETP is the green uh, rhombus, and that's pretty much close to the zebra accuracy with breaker one and breaker two if you have the small genomes here. And the red thing is basically the breaker three accuracy. So I think this plot answers a lot of your previous questions, like what to do when. Like if you can, run the breaker three, definitely. If you cannot, you can resort, if it's a smaller, medium-sized genome, to breaker one and breaker two with zebra, and that's still doing a decent job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops, here. Okay. Now, if we look at the larger genomes, uh, the mouse, the chicken, and the tomato, you see that the dots don't scatter together that closely anymore. You see breaker one and breaker two, if they complete, here they did, if they don't crash, the accuracy is quite low. Um, even if you combine them with zebra, the accuracy remains low. And the reason for this is, as I said before, that GeneMark basically cannot handle the large repeats in these genomes. Um, and that's reflected in the GeneMark gene set, which is used to train Augustus, so everything goes bogus. Um, but GeneMark ETP, as you see, has much better accuracy. And if you put breaker 3 on top, the accuracy on gene level increases by, on average, another 9%. So this is a pipeline that you can also use for annotating vertebrates if you have a lot of RNSEC data. Mm, the usage of breaker is hopefully straightforward, and I hope I can like clarify all confusions. It's a Perl script. It doesn't matter whether you want to run breaker one, breaker two, or breaker three. It's always breaker.pl. That's the script. It for running breaker three needs a genome file, which should be in faster format. And also you should pay attention to the headers. Um, so some assembly tools output faster files that have very long and complex headers. And there are limitations how we can handle these headers. So look at your genome file before running breaker and make sure that the headers are comparably short, have no special characters and uh, hopefully no spaces. That should do the job. And you should have used the same file for your RNSEC alignment. Don't use a different file. 
Um, then you need input of a protein database in FASTA format. Um, usually we recommend OrthoDB. We also provide OrthoDB partitions for many different clades. If you need it for another clade, just let us know. We can prepare it for you. Um, word of warning, some clades are really small, so you need to combine that with a bigger clade possibly. Um, and then there are different ways on how to run Breaker 3. Let's jump back a little bit. I said we start with a BAM file here. In principle, Breaker 2 can also start with the FASTQ files. If you have your own local FASTQ files, you can input these and they will be splice aligned with high set 2 automatically by Breaker 3. It happens in GeneMark ETP. Um, if you don't use our container, if you manage magically to set it up without our container, which is difficult, um, then you can also input sequence read archive IDs and the sequence read archive toolkit will be used to sample uh, or, or to download these libraries, these FASTQ files from the sequence read archive. This is a little bit tricky in Singularity. In Docker, it might even work, but in Singularity, we have a problem with setting up the sequence read archive toolkit at the moment. Okay, so depending on how you want to run it, you can uh, pro provide, for example, the RNSSEC set IDs basically means the accession IDs from the sequence read archive or the names of your local FASTQ files. Yeah? Um, and if you have local FASTQ files, you should also say where they live with RNSSEC set years and then provide the directory of where they are. If you're wondering about runtime, like in real life, um, we average the numbers for you across all the genomes I showed accuracy before, and we ran that on 48 threads on pretty old HPC nodes. Um, you see Breaker 3 runtime was on average around 18 hours. Um, it's not scaling linearly with the genome size. It also depends a lot on the amount of RNSSEC data. It depends a lot on the size of the protein database. So it could also be running for three days. Yeah, don't be surprised. It can also finish very fast. Someone has a question. Hello. Hi. Um, I, have a, I have a specific question about Breaker 3. And you already said that it's sort of flaky at times. Um, but you show for the chicken that actually the results are pretty good. So we tried to do the same with another bird genome using R2DB and um, same individual RNA seq data from plenty of tissues. But in the breaker out breaker three GFF, the Busco score was about six percent lower than just the plain Augustus. Um, that's bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> but do you have any idea why? Yeah, I do have a pretty good idea why. I even had students on working on an implementation to fix it. Um, <laughs> so let's go back to the slide here. Um, there's this combiner set here with uh, step with Zebra. And on average, it is a good idea to do this. But we are aware that in some cases, Zebra is um, like eliminating buscos. Mostly it's single exon genes that you're losing. Um, the, the problem is if you look at the buscos, uh, buscos are very often single exon genes, but in the large genomes like the birds, <laughs> we actually, we discard all single exon genes that have no evidence. That's where you lost your buscos. Um, it is possible to fix this very easily um, because Zebra has um, an optional command line flag to enforce a gene set. You can, for example, rerun Zebra on the Augustus gene set, enforcing the Augustus gene set. Um, you can check in the Breaker 3 log uh, how, to, how to call it otherwise. Um, and basically rerun that by enforcing the Augustus gene set, and then you will have your buscos restored. The problem is that currently we don't automatically do this. And the reason is that I have trouble handling busco in our container. <laughs> I have it in a container, but... It's, it's a bit complicated because it's a Conda install that needs an environment activation and then it will only work in the container. So I'm trying to figure that out, how to make that work in the container and outside of the container. Um, but that's the reason why it dropped Buscos in your case. And it can be restored if you basically do this here, but don't use a Breaker 1 and Breaker 2 gene set, but use the GeneMark gene set and the Augustus gene set from the Breaker 3 run. And there are issues about that on GitHub, and I'm pretty sure I even specified a command about it at some point in time. If you really cannot find it, make another issue. We have the command for that. Great, thanks. 
I can also give you the product of my students programming. Um, if you don't want to run it in the container, that will also do the job automatically. <laughs> I'm fine with containers. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's that was basically this. What I wanted to point out is that the runtime of Breaker 1 and Breaker 2 is a lot smaller, and the runtime for the RNSEC alignment is not included in the Breaker 3 runtime here. Um, on our HPC, I don't know how yours works, but on our HPC, my jobs get killed after three days. So I usually do the alignment outside of Breaker. Like I do that as separate jobs because sometimes the Breaker 3 runtime otherwise exceeds the three days and then my job dies. Okay. Um, availability. So if you're an academic user, you can be very happy. Uh, Breaker is available freely for everyone. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, you can build a Docker container that we provide. You can execute that with Singularity. Breaker is under artistic license. Um, GeneMark ETP um, is under a different license. It's currently under the license for GeneMark family software. Basically, that license says that if you are not an academic user, you need to contact them and negotiate a price and then you can also use it. I hope most people here are from academia. Um, there is an ongoing debate on whether or not this GeneMark license can be changed. We are working on that, but I don't know how it's going to play out. Now, since you were talking about a bird genome, I want to introduce you to the Galba pipeline. The Galba pipeline could as well have been a breaker pipeline. But I had to rename it because GeneMark is not part of it. And then the GeneMark people are unhappy if I put that in the pipeline. So we have a new team here. It's also international effort, um, mainly driven by Hengli and Tomasz Brunner um, and by a lot of people in our group here in Greifswald. And uh, actually also someone from New Zealand, Joseph is from New Zealand. Um, when Hengli earlier this year published Miniprot, um, I want to quote that. He said, Miniprot is a fast protein to genome aligner comparable to existing tools in accuracy. Its primary use case is to assist gene annotation. So he very clearly had this in mind. And then he approached us and he said, can we put that into a breaker? And I was like, well, it makes a lot of sense, um, <clears throat> but I have this problem. If we have Miniprot in there, we need no GeneMark. Um, so I basically took the breaker code and threw out all GeneMark stuff and plugged in Miniprot. And the initial idea was to have a very simple pipeline. Uh, the idea was to have the pipeline that basically runs Miniprot with some proteins, close relatives probably, trains Augustus and predicts genes. In the beginning, we had a big headache here in Greifswald, whether it's worth it, because it's additional time that we have to spend. Um, and also there is so much RNSEC data, like do we need a pipeline without RNSEC data at the moment? I'm not sure. Um, maybe. Actually, now I know there are about 1000 genomes already available for which this would be highly relevant. Um, but the main motivation to proceed with the project was that Breaker doesn't work so well in the large genomes. Uh, and this here has no limitations for large genomes. So that was a motivation to go ahead. Also, we have again and again issues on GitHub where people try to run Breaker 3 or Breaker 2 and the protein input is not an OrthoDB partition. They try to run it with that one protein set of a close relative and then Breaker dies because GeneMark doesn't survive. Um, this is not a problem in such a pipeline, right? It can work with one or a few reference species. And I'm not, um, that's not a secret, not a big fan of the GeneMark family license. So this had the potential of being open source. So Tomas and I were like really happy. <laughs> it turned out to be a lot more complicated than expected um, to get high accuracy. Um, what happened when we basically had this very simple pipeline is shown in this plot up here. So this is a currency not in a large genome. It's in Drosophila. Galba is not made for Drosophila, but Drosophila is a good benchmarking data set. It's small, it's fast. So we ran Galba, the initial version, with Drosophila simulans proteins as input. This is like a super close relative. And I would have expected a currency to be way higher than that. Um, and also with a combination of um, yeah, more distantly related Drosophila species. They're not as close as the simulans, which is like almost identical to Melanogaster, uh, but they're also not out of the order or anything. Yeah, it's still the same Ganos. So that is the blue thing. Uh, so we were really worried about this accuracy. 
So the first thing that we fixed was that when we looked at the mini plot alignments in a genome browser, sometimes we had alignments um, for one locus from several protein donors. And the way that this went into training Augustus was in the beginning to throw all of these gene structures into training and then do random selection. So instead of random selection, we tried to get the best training gene as a smart move. Didn't help much. And then I called Tomas and I was like, Tomas, I need you to make our protein alignments less noisy because they look horrible. <laughs> And then he went into his old Breaker 2 code and he checked how we did it there. And he basically re-implemented a part of the Breaker 2 code, which we couldn't just take because it's under the GeneMark family license. So we had to make a new tool and that's now called Miniprotent and that denoises Miniprot alignments, basically. So that helped a lot. And then I thought about how is GeneMark doing the self-training? It's basically iteratively retraining on better and better sets. So we also introduced an iterative retraining. So that mm, pushed accuracy. But GALBA is not a good pipeline for insects, okay? It's a good pipeline for vertebrates. This here is the worst plot I've made in my career. I made it with Google Sheets, in case you're wondering. And what it shows you is accuracy uh, of GALBA in 14 species. You have here the insects with increasing genome size. Then we have C. elegans, which is metazoa. Then we have a couple of plants up to the tomato with genome size increasing. And then we have vertebrates also with increasing genome size. And what we want to compare here is basically a courtesy of Galba, red triangle, to a courtesy of Breaker 2. Yeah, because these are really comparable to each other. They are pipelines that basically automate gene prediction with the protein input. And the protein input here has been the same. It's identical protein input. It's not OrthoDB. It's uh, proteins of relatively close, um, closely related species. And what we can observe is that in vertebrate genomes, GALBA works a lot better than BRCA2, which is no surprise because we knew before that GeneMark doesn't work well in these genomes, so BRCA2 didn't either. If GeneMark works well, then very often um, BRCA2 is the better choice. So this should give you an indication for the future, like if you have uh, a vertebrate genome, Think about using GALBA if you have no RNA-seq data. But if it's uh, not a big genome, if it's like uh, some small insect or small fungus or small metazoa, small plant, uh, stick with Breaker 2. I also show you here, and you ask about that specifically, what happens if you run a gene predictor with the genome sequence only? GeneMark ES is a self-training gene finder that uses the gene mark, uh, genome sequence only. That's those green dots. And you see that works, for example, I would say reasonably well in Drosophila, but it works horribly in vertebrates and yeah, usually rather poorly, but you can do that. Okay, so where are we with the gene F1 accuracy um, of GALBA? Ballpark numbers, we are somewhere between the 30, 40, 50%. Mostly it's good for large genomes when you have no RNA-seq data, which happens, and you want to use proteins of closely related species. Actually, Tomas and I are working on expanding that to OrthoDB partitions, but the version that's on GitHub today cannot do that. So these were the pipelines. Now I want to move on on how can we know whether any kind of genome annotation worked well. And this does not only apply to Breaker and Galba, it applies as well to Easel, it applies to Maker, basically everything, or even a reference annotation that to download from somewhere. I think so, that's the yeah. question, which is at what level of species relatedness is it just better to use Liftoff or any other transfer tool for annotation, which is, I think, what you're sort of referring to here. Yeah. So if it's a strain of the same species, I would definitely go with Liftover. Otherwise, the problem is that the species concept is quite unclear. Like sometimes uh, going across species with liftover may be difficult <laughs> and sometimes not because our understanding of species has been shaped by people who observe how things look like. Um, so this is a question that I cannot very clearly answer. <laughs> Were there other questions on the Discord? Nope, that's it for now. Okay, good. Okay, so one of the most important things, and that's often neglected, is visualize your genome annotation. 
And it doesn't matter what tool you use. You can use the UCSC genome browser. I have in the hands-on session some code on how to run makeup to prepare that. Uh, or you can use JBrowse, or you can use Apollo or whatever you like. Uh, what is important is that you visualize your gene structures together with the evidence that went into making the gene set. Yeah, And you want to look at that. You want to look at whether the gene structures make sense in context with the evidence. For example, it would look pretty weird to me if the blue breaker gene set, uh, breaker gene up here would be split into two genes. Yeah, then I would zoom in and check whether there is like a frame shift or something occurring because otherwise this looks like it should be one gene structure. Yeah, you want to spot such problems. Um, and you can, for example, randomly generate 10 or 20 loci. That's what I usually do. And then we look at them and we say, okay, overall, not perfect gene set, but it looks okay. Or we say, no, this looks like really, really bad. <laughs> and if it looks really, really bad, you want to try another pipeline, trust me. <laughs> Maybe it cannot be solved, but hopefully it can. That is one thing. Another thing is that if later you want to publish your paper, yeah, or you want to talk to someone about your gene set, uh, you can describe your annotation. You can say, I have 30,000 genes. Uh, this makes 45,000 transcripts. Um, the group of Jill Wagerson uh, suggested recently in a review called Welcome to the Big Leaves to report the mono to multi-exonic gene ratio. Um, they also have a cutoff recommendation that I strongly disagree with, but that's a different topic. But you can report that. And you can compare that to relative species. And you can say, OK, this looks kind of similar to what we expect, or this looks like totally different. Something is wrong, maybe, or very different. Um, you can report median number of exons per transcript or maximal number of exons per transcript, median transcript length, and all these features. And I would recommend that you do that, like summarize your data. And if possible, compare to annotations of close relatives in the same way. Yeah, and then you can um, think whether um, this is good or bad that your results look the same or different. There are things to be kept in mind. Like, for example, a lot of the previous genomes have been annotated by the community with the makeup pipeline. I have nothing against the makeup pipeline, but you have to know that the makeup pipeline has a tendency to join gene structures. Um, it's, it's built in by, by how they handle evidence. Breaker doesn't do that. So comparing those gene sets, it doesn't necessarily, um, is, is not necessarily a quality indicator um, of any kind if they differ in their statistics. Yeah, you need to be aware of such things. Okay, another great tool that can give you a lot of information is Busco. There, is there another session coming up or is it already over? Both are already over and they were really good, but we have- But they were recorded, right? So you can maybe watch the recordings if you need to run Busco. So Busco is a tool that basically checks for clade-specific conserved genes, either in the genome or in the protein set. And I recommend you to do both. Like first check the Buscos that are supposed to be in your genome, then check how many of these do you find in your predicted gene set. Um, and if you are working uh, with something like, for example, uh, breaker one, breaker two, and zebra, you could also like compare all of these sub gene sets to each other to spot the problem that one of the uh, people here raised. That sometimes you drop buscos if you run zebra. You can spot that if you run busco. What you want to see is uh, a big blue bar. Yeah, if you don't have a big blue, big blue bar, that means that you're missing a lot of buscos, and that's bad. There's a question or, I don't know. Sorry, I was just pasting the YouTube link. Ah, okay, video. good. <laughs> okay, um, more recently, uh, there is another great tool that I want to point you towards. It's OMARC. And I know that there were also sessions for OMARC. <laughs> and um, the idea behind OMARC is in a way, um, at least to 50% similar to Busco, I would say. Um, it's also checking for a set of conserved genes in your proteome. Um, the set is much bigger than the Busco set. Um, it's also clade specific, but it's usually a lot more. And OMARC can also find other problems. Like it, it will also tell you, um, for example, 
uh, if you have a lot of inconsistent predictions that uh, usually wouldn't show in such a genome. So uh, that gives you mm, a good idea about quality. And I highly recommend that you look into running OMARC if you do the novo genome annotation. Okay. Now we have had a lot of slides. Are there more questions before we move on? I do, I do have a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Um, so some time ago, I was running Breaker 2 on an insect's genome, and um, I had way too many genes. So I saw a suggestion on GitHub to use the select uh, subset, select supported subset uh, Python script. And then I uh, reached the expected number of genes. So I was wondering if you still uh, would recommend using that after running Breaker 3 or if um, um, like... Uh, that depends on the genome size. So generally, re really do the BUSCO as a quick quality estimate. That's mm -hmm. a good idea. So this script that you're referring to, it often helps, but sometimes it drops BUSCOs because okay. it depends on the availability of evidence. Like if, if I have um, like service projects for genome annotation, I also, I just run Busco on the different possible gene sets and then I pick the best one. Um, yeah, you can use that. And okay. Breaker 3 may, if it's a small or medium sized genome, also heavily over predict. So your problem was an over prediction. Yeah. Mostly what's over predicted are single exon genes. To some extent, you can try to quench that by more rigorous repeat masking, but not fully. <laughs> um, that's why I recommend that step. In the large genomes, Breaker 3 automatically tries to filter out such genes. But as we have heard today already, and as we have also observed not only in vertebrates, also in sea stars uh, recently, um, sometimes we discard too much um yeah we're working mm. on an automated um, all right solution for that that is compatible with the container no container thing we have a script for it but it's not on github yet i think <laughs> all right thank you and um well i have another question um you you mentioned that breaker 3 does not work with a long read uh rna seq or we haven't well, tested yeah <laughs> So I, I do not yet have RNA-seq, but I was considering using ISO-seq, uh, but now I'm kind of reconsidering it because I would really like to use Breaker. So what, what would be your advice? Do you think it would be better to go for RNA-seq so that I can use Breaker or, well, to go for ISO-seq to have long reads and better transcripts? Uh, it's not only prediction. about Breaker. So mm. what we have seen in many projects okay. is that the ISO-seq data um, is good for some part of the gene set, uh, but there is a lot of information that you are usually missing compared to when you do Illumina uh, sequencing of the transcriptome. Um, so I usually currently recommend collaboration partners to go for Illumina short read sequencing, um, okay. not because I want to run Breaker, but because <laughs> otherwise we're missing information. We, we have played quite a lot with long read data. We even have some protocol on GitHub that you can try with the long reads. It's not a problem. Our problem why we don't have a paper on it is that it doesn't guarantee better results than using short read data. That's our challenge. And it's not only our challenge, others are fighting that too. Okay, thank you very much. It's helpful. Okay. If there are no further questions, then the plan would be that we move to Gitpod um, and start Gitpod with the Breaker 3 repository. For this, you find a link um, on the slides that you could click on, or you could even use the QR code. I hope that thing works. <laughs> Um, I've put the link in the chat and in the Okay, screen. good. Uh, so I will stop my screen sharing because for me, booting the Git pod also takes a little while uh, because I stopped it so that I don't waste my credits. I've used it quite a lot for development. <laughs> and I hope that most of you manage to follow us along uh, and start the Git pod thingy. For this, you need, in case you had not seen the instructions before, you need a GitHub account to do that. I think everybody on the call should have one. But. Okay, that is great. So I'm showing the wrong thing. Let me move around windows. Yeah, you see my Git pod thing is starting. 
Yeah, this is a big, um, I think it's a big container uh, and it downloads yes. some data. So it takes a few, a minute or two, which is still amazing that it still works well. So Yeah. So to provide some background, um, basically what we're doing right now is pulling uh, the Docker container of Breaker 3. So this is exactly the same software environment that you will get if you do that on some other resource. It's also exactly the same that you can run in Singularity on your own HPC. I really like uh, the Git pod for this demo today, um, but I would highly recommend that you go on some HPC node with, I don't know, 48 to 72 threads for running Breaker 3 in real life. It will complete on uh, fewer resources, but you might run out of Gitpod credits. And uh, the other large part that's in the container that we're like now building from the Breaker 3 containers that I put in a real OrthoDB partition for you. So you will later have a choice to use real data or uh, mock data. <laughs> and that's also why it takes a long time. Okay. So maybe you can give us. Um, I don't know, a smiley or something uh, in the reactions in Zoom if you have managed to start your, or your thumb upgrade, uh, your Gitpod environment. And maybe also let us know if you have trouble uh, in the chat or, or say something to Sujai, he might be able to help you. Um. I've got somebody saying no B3 environment, but if you click on the link, you get B3. What I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Yeah. So let me show you. Um, no, no, you, you're fine. What again. what you're seeing on the screen is what we should all be seeing. Yeah, yeah, I know. But um, just so that you understand, you go to gitpod.io slash hash mark, and then you put uh, the GitHub repository of the BGA Academy session in there. So the link is more than gitpod.io. Ah, I think I understand the question. No, there isn't a B3 Conda environment because as Katharina said, if you've been listening, it's a Docker container that's being checked out. So in this case, if you look at the Gitpod YAML, you'll see that it's actually just pulling the actual Docker container for Breaker 3 and it's starting that. So Gitpod can work with Conda environments. It can work with Docker images. It can also check out GitHub code and then you can compile it and run it. So you don't need anything else. Yeah. Yeah, the reason why we don't have an official Conda uh, recipe for Breaker is Genemark, just yeah. in case you're you wondering. Said that. I remember that, and I was really it's, glad that it worked with Gitpod. Yeah, it's like a license issue. Um, we're working on, on figuring that out with the Georgia Tech team. Okay, so I hope that, I mean, the thumbs always disappear after a while, but I hope that some of you, <laughs> at least we had like seven thumbs, have started their Gitpod session and you should see something similar to what I see. Um, what you have at the bottom is a terminal. I will type in ABC. So this is where the terminal is. This is where we can execute software. Then on the left, you have a file navigator and we're going to work with the B3 folder. You can click at that, at that arrow, and then you get basically the GitHub repository um, files in there. Most importantly, we want to have the tutorial markdown file. Yeah, so I will open that here. Um, this is still source code view. If I want to have a preview, I can press um, Control Shift V. Then I have a beautiful markdown rendering. So it's Control plus Shift plus V if you want to repeat that on your own computer. Um, the th this Gitpod instance has basically uh, the Docker container of Breaker 3 underlying. On top of it, it has the Breaker 3 uh, B3 repository for this workshop. And then it has a folder ODB where we have the um, plants or the DB uh, partition in case you want to use that for running your test job later, just so you know what we have. I will try to make this file navigation thing a little bit smaller <laughs> so that we can see more of the markdown document. So this markdown file that are, I'm going to talk about now for a while, um, it's very long. It has a lot of information and it has also information on steps that we cannot execute here and we don't want to execute today. Yeah, this is just to provide you with a little bit of background knowledge on what you need to do in real life, possibly with other containers that are not ours. 
And as a demo example, we're using a very artificially created um, part of the Arbidopsis thaliana genome. So we manually selected parts of chromosomes from Arbidopsis thaliana that are rich in genes in order to have a data set um, that is comparably fast for running breaker. Yeah, in real life, you would take a complete genome. I said before that repeat masking can help a lot in accuracy when it comes to genome annotation. And that is not only the case for BRCA3, it's like a, kind of a universal concept. Um, you don't want a gene finder to predict genes all over the place and parts that are repeats. So what we usually do also today, even though RET is around, um, we use Repeat Modeler 2 to build um, a species-specific repeat library. And we use that particular library with Repeat Masker to mask the genome. This is something that is not contained in our um, Docker container. And you see here that I usually run that with 72 threads. And you want to do that, trust me. <laughs> um, this is very time consuming. It's something you do not want to do on your um, Dell XPS notebook that I run Zoom conferences on. Um, there are alternatives that are faster. You can use RED for masking genomes, also for Breaker. It will probably work well. Um, it has a little bit lower accuracy. It's why we're still on repeat modeler. So this very simple approach that I show here, which is basically a run repeat modeler and then run repeat masker is usually fine for the small and medium sized genomes. For the large genomes like mouse uh, or chicken, we need to mask more because repeat masker will miss a lot of repeats. If you like look at the genome sequences and at the masking, you will see visually very easily that something has not been masked that is clearly repetitive. So. If that ever happens to you that you need to work on a vertebrate, we provide you a number of commands that you can use to run an additional tandem repeat finder step that gets rid of these repeats. And when I say mask for repeats, I mean soft mask. So it's very important that in repeat masker use the X small flag because otherwise it will not be soft masked. Otherwise uh, bases will be converted to ends. That's something you don't want to do. Um, Word of warning, this whole repeat model or repeat masker thing is kind of an older pipeline and it needs a very fast storage input output. Yeah, if you have an HPC system where you have centrally mounted home directories, depending on how exactly the stuff is connected, it may be a very bad idea to have your data sitting there. You may want to copy that onto your compute nodes or even relocate it into memory if you have that option on your system just um, to make your life easier. But we will um, today start with this artificial genome that is already masked. Then I said before, even though Breaker can in principle run um, the alignment for you, we usually do that separately in order to keep the runtime below three days for Breaker 3, yeah? So I'm also showing you here how we usually execute high set two. We're not going to do that today, um, but it's pretty standard. You build a high set to genome index, and then you can download data and you can align it. Um, again, you want to do that on some kind of resource that has a lot of threads. Like, I don't know, this example here ran a long time with eight. I usually do that on nodes for 72 or 256 threads. Mm. There was something, maybe a question, because Discord said something on my phone. Yep, Compute just... node generally does not have space no, for no. data. Well, it's then the you're screwed. <laughs> you can ask your admin whether you can copy or whether you can use the memory as storage. This yeah. is what I do. Like yeah. we have the option, but it has to be installed to mount the RAM as hard drive, basically. It, it simulates a hard drive. And that's super fast. It's my favorite thing to do with repeat modeler and repeat masker. <laughs> but it depends on what your admin is willing to do for you. Um, okay. The other question was, could you repeat the name of the less accurate repeat masker? Or the oh, yeah, it's called red, uh, like the color. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Robert just replied that. Yeah. Um, we are not using red, uh, but I know that the EBI is heavily using it now. Okay. Good. Then we move on to the annotation of protein coding genes with 
breaker. So as I said before, a breaker is a Perl script. Um, and it has very old dependencies and it sucks to manually install them, which is why we give you this Docker container now that also works in singularity. Yeah, but just be aware if you want to install it without the container, you have to install old Perl modules uh, and you have to um, install also the Augustus dependencies. Augustus uh, needs the boost library and it needs a MySQL C++ library. It's a little bit of a pain to do this without the container if you don't have root permissions. Um, Today, I will basically try to walk you through how to run Breaker 3, because that's why you joined um, this session. But as I said before, Breaker 3 is sometimes fragile. Under the hood, GeneMark ETP is a little bit fragile, depending on the data input. Um, and if it crashes, you can still use Breaker 1 or Breaker 2, same container, just slightly different call. Like, just don't call it with both RNSSEC and protein data. Just use only one of these data sources, and it switches mode automatically. And if it's a large genome and you have no RNSSEC data, you can also run Galba. Galba sits in a different container, but the command line usage is highly similar. Okay. Now, the code that we will execute today, I show you the code cell to run breaker three looks like this. And you see there's a lot of common text in there. One thing that we need to be aware of is how many threads we're going to run breaker with. Um, on my Gitpod session, I have eight threads. That's why T says eight, and it should be fine for you guys today. Um, it is no problem to go to something like 48 threads or 72 threads. Um, it is possible that breaker dies if you have too many threads because there is a step where we do data parallelization. And when the buckets where we split the data in become empty, the pipeline crashes. So if you have a highly, or not highly, if you have a very small genome with very few sequences, it is possible that you cannot scale up to a lot of threads, just so that you know that. In Galba, that is not a problem. There, everything is handled a bit differently. So today we do eight threads. In reality, I do rather like 48 or 72 threads. Um, if you use the real OrthoDB data, this job will compute 30 minutes. If you use my fake protein database, it will take five minutes. Yay! <laughs> so by default, if you copy paste code, it will run five minutes. You have at the bottom this terminal window here, right? So running breaker will mean that you basically copy things from the markdown file into your terminal and hit enter. Yeah, if I want to execute TS8, I have to put TS8 in there and press enter. This step here is basically if you repeat the session later, in case the output exists, the output will be deleted so you can recreate it. We don't have to do that the first time around. It's just in there if you do that again. Then you can make a choice. Like, do you want to use real OrthoDB partition? Then you copy paste this part. That is the real Viridi Plante partition of ODB 11. Or if you want to be fast, I want to be fast, you use a very small protein file that is designed just big enough to not make breaker die. <laughs> it has a certain level of redundancy, um, but it's pretty small. Um, if you are wondering where I get those partitions from, I also included the link here that we have on our GitHub page. Um, we actually host the partitions for ODB 11 in collaboration uh, with Yevgeny's group. So previously, Switzerland would provide um, these partitions, but most recently they don't do that anymore. So we have an agreement that we can do that on our website. So if you don't need plants, just go there and download another one. If what you're looking for is not there, reach out to me. I can see whether I can prepare that for you. We also document what software we use. So you can also do it yourself if you want to figure that out. Now let's look at the breaker command. Having a time measurement in front of your command is not essential for running breaker. I have that in there so that if you don't pay constant attention to your job later, you know it was running for five minutes or for 30 minutes. So the real call starts here with breaker PL. Um, what breaker wants to have is a folder to store all output in. Um, so this is what we call the working gear. A lot of reading and writing will happen to this folder. Again, if you have the option on your HPC to do this locally on the node, do it locally on the node. Um, but this is not as heavy as with repeat modeler and repeat masker. Um, you don't have to specify the working directory. 
if you don't do it, uh, then Breaker will automatically create a folder called Breaker. Um, but this might be a bummer if you do it multiple times for different genomes, because then you have folders of the same name all around. So maybe give it a name. Then we need input file, the genome file. Uh, let's have a look at how this looks like. Now I'm not sure whether I have less in my container. <laughs> I will find out soon. I do. Okay. So this is a simple multiple FASTA file. Um, it should be soft masked. Here you see some lowercase letters. So it has been soft masked. And you see again, the identifiers of the sequence are short and simple, no spaces, no special characters. They don't have to be two letters. They can also be like, I don't know, 20 letters and numbers. That's not a problem. But something that is very, very long causes problems down the line, not only with breaker, but also with the aligners. So We've seen that. Then we have a BAM file that was created with HiSet2 for you in advance. We cannot open that in the same way because it's a binary format, but I can show you at least the size. Yeah, so this BAM file, for example, has 164 MB and it contains HiSet2 spliced alignments against exactly this genome thing from uh, two Arabidopsis RNA-seq libraries that I found on Sequence Read Archive. They were selected at random. Um, then here we input with PROTSEC the protein database. So I usually call that uh, OrthoDB, but if you use the, the mock data set, it's not a real OrthoDB partition. You can, of course, also plug in the name here. I just wanted to make this code flexible for you so that you could easily switch between the alternatives, okay? It doesn't have to be a variable. Um, in the Docker container, I think we could even take that out. We had a bit of problems with expanding the path variable for a while, <laughs> but I think I fixed it now. In any case, you can, to be like sure and not sorry, specify where Augustus sits. Yeah, Augustus resides in user bin if you install it on Ubuntu usually. And in the container, it's the same. It's Ubuntu under the hood. And also you can, but you don't have to specify where the scripts of Augustus live. And in the Debian package, they're installed in user share Augustus scripts. I believe that if you would delete these two, it should also work now because I spent some time on the breaker container to fix the path variable. Um, but to be sure, we can keep it there. Here we specify the number of threads um, should be eight because we said eight before. And then I have two options that I want to point out are really, really bad options for a real genome annotation. Yeah, there are options called GMX intergenic um, for limiting the maximal intergenic size for GeneMark to 10,000 and skip optimize, which I introduce here to make the runtime short. It will make bad gene structures. Like if you have a real job, you go ahead and you delete this here. Yeah, but then it will run a lot longer and um, our session will be over in like 20 minutes. So that's a problem. <laughs> so I will go ahead now and copy with the mock data my command into the terminal and you're welcome to do the same. And it starts computing. This is normal output that you will see. Let's quickly look at what it does. It tells you that it's creating a working directory in our case, in workspace breaker. Uh, it tells you that it got both protein and RNSEC data. So it will be executed in ETP, gene mark ETP mode, which corresponds to breaker three. Then it gives you configuration uh, information. It reiterates the call in case you forget what you did later. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm scrolling poorly. I have trouble getting to the right lines. Uh, here we are, okay. Um, one thing is that Augustus, every time that it trains parameters for a novel species, it takes a folder that's sitting in a certain directory, makes a copy of that folder, and then it uses that as a template for training Augustus. And this folder that is copied, it sits in a directory that we refer to as the Augustus config path. And if you run Augustus uh, a breaker in our container, it will always give you a warning it will tell you the Augustus config path is not writable because it is not. It sits in a place where normal users cannot modify it. <laughs> um, so what Breaker automatically does after this warning is it says, I will try to copy the Augustus config directory to a writable location. And now you should know what happens under the hood. It will first copy it into your home directory. If it cannot copy it to your home directory, it will copy it into the folder where you're executing Breaker. 
this might be of interest to you because maybe you want to keep these parameters and recall them later. So you have to know where they end up. So either in home directory .augustus, or if that failed because you didn't mount it or something, it will go to the place where it's currently writing data. Okay, and then it tells you all further information will be found in the breaker log. Now we will happily keep this running and open a separate terminal window. There is a plus character on the bottom right of VS Code, like uh, above the wget thingy. Ah, that opens a new terminal. And we can check with top that our job is running right now. My job is in the GeneMark HMM step, or it was at least a few seconds ago. <laughs> it's still running. I'm not worried about it. Here we go again. It's uh, multi-threaded, it repeats doing things. Um, and we can also look at the output that's produced. So we can go to the breaker three folder with CD breaker three, do LS minus L, see what files are in there. And here is our log file. So if you're wandering down the line while your job's computing for three days, what is happening? You can go into the breaker log file and read it. Yeah, it will basically give you all the information. And right now we see it's in the GeneMark ETP step. Also, if your job dies and you want to make a GitHub issue about it, please provide the information that you find in this log file. We need the complete call. We need the information that's in the log file and possibly we will need access to your data, but this we can figure out down the line. And sometimes we're unable to help you. Okay, now I will shrink this a little bit again. I said before, it's gonna take a while to compute this. Um, let me, no, that's the wrong window. Yeah, it's still running, of course. Um, so I have prepared for you a folder um, that is called breaker three pre-computed results here, this one. And this folder contains exactly the output that your job um, will probably produce. I think it contains the output with the real orthodb file. So if you see differences later, it's not with the mock protein file, it's with the other file. But it looks like a real breaker three output directory. Um, this should always have the breaker log file, the breaker GTF file with the gene models, a coding seq file, which is a faster file with the coding sequences of protein coding genes, and a protein file called breaker AA that has the protein sequence of all the predicted genes. Oh, look, my job finished. Maybe yours finished too. It took only four minutes and 19 seconds today. Nice. Okay. Um, so let's um, have a look at other things that are in this folder. We can see there is a folder called Augustus here. This Augustus folder now contains all the native Augustus gene models. Again, GTF, coding, sake protein file. And there's a GeneMark folder, and the GeneMark folder, most importantly, contains the GeneMark GTF file. Take note, it does not natively contain a protein file. If you need a protein file of these GeneMark models, I can tell you how to create it. That's not a problem, but it's not there on its own. It's not part of the breaker pipeline to produce this, and they don't produce it. Okay. You also have, if something goes very wrong, a folder that is called errors, which contains the error logs of a number of steps in the pipeline. There are some steps that always write something to the standard error. Yeah. So um, if you have these four files, it's nothing to worry about. If there are a lot more, something went very wrong usually. So you can read in those error logs whether something went very wrong. And then you also have this species folder. and Note that we did not tell Breaker how to name our species. You have the option to say, in addition to what we have here, to say, well, I want to type in this. Ah, here we go. You have the option to say, minus minus species is, I don't know, the fly. Then your parameter set will be called the fly. Maybe don't call it fly, maybe call it something that makes sense, like the Latin name or the common name that you know your species with. If you don't tell it, it will produce a directory structure um, where all the parameters are called sp underscore and then a number. Hmm. If you want to launch hundreds of breaker jobs at the same point in time, you have to give a species name. 
because if it's hundreds starting at the same point in time, it always checks what is the highest number that has been assigned before. <laughs> and uh, then it becomes a little bit messy from there, you will get errors. So if you do many breaker jobs in parallel, give it a species name. If you don't care, if you do only one, you don't care how they are named, you can just skip it. So these are copies of the Augustus parameters, but this is not the folder where Augustus uses them. This is just a copy for you in case you like don't figure out where we keep the parameter files. I said before, they are also in your home directory or in the Augustus config path or in the directory where you call breaker. They're hidden there. Okay. So... Do we have questions up to now about uh, how to run Breaker? No, I was just saying I love the tip about the SP1 and the species and the fact that, yeah, lots of things can interfere. Yeah, I just hope it's not too confusing. It's all kind of special things that can happen. Okay, we were here. So what I suggest to do now is because I've prepared the Markdown notebook um, with the pre-computed results, the same files also exist in your breaker three output folder. I would use the pre-computed results so that I don't create a mess in my code, okay? I will go into the B3 repository folder into the pre-computed results, and I will look at the file sizes of the different output files, the GTF files. That's basically the core output of breaker for me. Because from these GTF files, you can generate everything else right? They have the information. So we see here the breaker GTF file has like 409 kilobyte, the GeneMark file has 407, and the Augustus Hints file has 399. Um, if you see when you do such an inspection that one of these gene sets is suspiciously small, you might want to check back what went wrong. So that's why we do this. Um, the main output Usually is the breaker GTF file, but if like with the bird genome, you realize there are bus codes missing, you might want to rejoin the Augustus Hints GTF with the GeneMark GTF and enforce the Augustus Hints GTF with Zebra. Yeah, that's a workaround here. Sorry, quick question. Hints, so I, I haven't done this in a while, but I remember long ago when I saw hints, I thought it meant it's just got the hints. Or does ah, it no, also that's have a different it? file. Um, the actual hints that are run uh, in Breaker is the hints file GFF, and we call the outputs of Augustus Augustus hints GTF because we can alternatively output Augustus ab initio GTF. Um, there is a command line flag of Breaker that allows you to make pure ab initio predictions. Usually people don't want to have them. That's why I didn't explain it. Um, but we always have to do that when we publish a paper. They always want to see up in the courtesy of Augustus. So that's why we have that option. And that's why it's not just called the Augustus GTF. Maybe we should change that in the future. I'll consider it. <laughs> um, there is uh, another very important file for you. And that is the what to cite file. Um, see, the breaker pipeline calls on a lot of other software. And one thing that we are really touchy about is when people run other pipelines that run our software and they forget to cite Augustus, for example. This is really bad for us because we need funding in the future. And so do all the people who generate the great software that's used by Breaker. So if you publish something based on a Breaker run, we give you the exact citations and please make sure that you cite all of them and please cite them in the main manuscript. Don't cite them in a supplementary hidden away um, because we want other groups to also have funding for the tools in the future. It's um, an important issue issue, something went really wrong with some pipelines in the past. Okay, so that um, will have different content depending on how you run Breaker. It tells you what exactly did it use. Now, as I said before, there is a protein file, and uh, protein files are the ones that you need if you later want to run Busco. Ah, I showed you Busco plot. We're not going to run Busco, but I show you where the protein files that are relevant to us are. Yeah, one protein file sits in the Augustus directory. It's the Augustus hints AA. Another protein file sits in the main working directory. It's the breaker AA. And I told you before, the gene mark protein file is missing, but we can easily generate that. So let's try this. Getting out of my what to cite thing. So I show you here, we have the Augustus protein file. Yeah, then here we go into the gene mark ETP folder. Whoops, 
I hope I do. Yes, I'm in there. And then we have a very simple Python script that can use as input a genome file and a GTF file. And then it will produce according to the output name that you give it, the AA file and the coding sake file here. These two files were now generated. Maybe we should put that into Breaker on the long term because I need to make them all the time. And this allows you to visualize, for example, with Busco, how the Busco scores in GeneMark, Augustus, and the Breaker gene set are, which is often something you want to do. Now I'll go one folder back up and look at the file sizes of all of them. Yeah, and we see that in this toy example, we don't have a large difference, but what we usually want to see is that there are a few more proteins in the breaker file than in the Augustus file. If that's not the case, that's the first indicator that you drop too much information. You see that in Buscos usually. Now, the next thing that I need to do a lot is counting number of transcripts, and we can do this on the command line with bash tool grep. Yeah, we can just grab the greater character and then we know how many transcripts we have. In our case, the number of transcripts will be the same as the number of protein sequences um, because we extract for every transcript a protein sequence. You can either count the coding six or you can count the proteins. It doesn't matter. So you see here, we have 301 uh, transcripts in the breaker file. GeneMark file had 278. That is very common because they can't do alternative transcripts. And Augustus had 292. As I said before, you want to see usually an increasement in the breaker output. Yeah, that's a good indicator that things went okay. Now, about the funny mono to multi exonic gene ratio. I wrote a script to compute that rapidly based on our output in case you want to do that. Um, but it's not in the container because it's uh, in Galba. Um, so we will download um, this uh, script into the breaker pre-computed results folder. It should, if it ever inserts, do it pretty rapidly. Here you have small script. We'll make that executable. And then we can compute um, descriptive statistics for all the gene sets. And that will include this monotomalt um, exon ratio. So this went a little bit too fast. Let's see, where was the call? Hmm. Can I scroll it better here? Yes, here you see, for example, if we apply it to the GeneMark GTF file, it will give you output such as number of transcripts. Uh, it will give you largest number of exons in all transcripts, uh, number of monoexonic transcripts, number of multi-exonic transcripts, the ratio, which um, in plants is apparently supposed to be around 0 0.2 or lower, but I have seen plants that have around 50%, so mm, not trusting that too much. Uh, and then also we have a box plot or kind of the, the numbers that you need to make a box plot uh, for the number of exons per transcript. Um, so we can do this basically for all these GTF files. It computes very quickly and you might want to keep an eye on that data. If you really see 80% of monoexon genes and you're not working on a fungus that usually has a lot of monoexon genes, something went wrong. Like just pointing out possible red flags that might occur. Okay. As I said before, data visualization, visualization is essential. We use the UCC genome browser a lot. But for using the UCC genome browser installed at UCC with your own data, you need a web server where you can host your data. Um, this may not be the best way for all of you. Um, I highly recommend that you get familiar with the J browse if you don't have your own web server where you have permissions to host data. However, if you do have a web server, then in my opinion, UCC Genome Browser is an excellent resource. And I created a software called Makeup that will generate the exact data structure that you need in order to prepare uh, your assembly hub. It's called an assembly hub that you host on your web server. Um, it's also multi-threaded because BEM file processing can be a little bit time consuming. We have a command there. If you want to use it for other data later, what you mainly need to change is the location of your genome file, the BEM file location. You can also have comma separated many of them and possibly the number of threads. And then of course, the locations of the hints file of the breaker GTF file and so on. But overall, this works as you see pretty easily. Uh, just don't be surprised if the BEM processing computes for a while in real life. 
And what you need to do then to look at it, you copy it onto your web server, you go to the UCC genome browser and open uh, your track hub from there. Instructions are in the notebook, and then you can look at also this exact uh, data structure that we just generated for quality control. Mm. One question that I get a lot is like, oh, I have uh, something, I have a genome browser, what do I look at? Um, I recommend <laughs> to look at the larger sequences, okay? So we have a script in Augustus to compute the sequence lengths. It also computes other stuff. You can apply that to your genome file. And then I basically say, uh, I want to look at the large ones and only a certain number, let's say five or 10 or 20. So I automatically generate loci that are not super small. And then I look at them in the browser. So that's mm, maybe good to know. So in the future, you're probably not gonna work on Gitpod. Um, if you want to execute the container that we are using today, you can do that on a machine with root permissions with Docker, with the command that I provide here, it will automatically pull the same container from Docker Hub. A word of warning, um, since GeneMark ETP and GeneMark ET and GeneMark EP are under the GeneMark family license, um, there is a license key involved. It's only available for non-commercial usage. If you're a commercial user, please do not use this container. Talk to Mark Bordowski's group. Uh, and also the license key has an expiration date. Um, you will have to update your container from time to time. I think it will expire in about 120 days or something. Um, so if the container stops working, just pull a new container. We will try to make sure that it will be available. I also give you singularity command, like if you want to use it in singularity on your HPC, you first need to build a SIF file and then you can execute it. Some users have reported because they used Augustus on the same machine before um, that they had trouble with interference of variables, of environment variables. There is a flag clean env that you can use to prevent that. So it does that it doesn't look in some other Augustus config path that you might previously have configured. And you need to mount the directories that you want to use. Yeah, mount all directories where you have data or where you're writing to. That's the most important stuff to know about this. Now, troubleshooting. What to do if Breaker 3 dies? <laughs> um, we can try to help you, but often there is not much we can do about it at the moment, apart from flagging it as an issue on GitHub. Um, you can try running Breaker 1 and Breaker 2 separately, merge with Zebra. Or if you have no RNSSEC data and it's a small genome, use Breaker 2. If you have no RNSSEC data, it's a large genome, try running Galba. Then we had the question before, like with the birds, we had, or, or some other genome, you said we had like so many, too many genes. Uh, what shall we do? <laughs> um, the first thing to do is to check whether you did your repeat masking properly. If you did your repeat masking properly, you still have too many genes, 80,000 sounds ballpark too high. Um, then uh, you might want to do something as we discussed before, like only keep the evidence supported genes. However, that's risky because sometimes really important genes are not evidence supported. So it's a tricky situation. Also, there are no hard thresholds. Like I cannot tell you, this is the typical number of genes you should get. It's very species specific. There are small parasites eukaryotic that have very few genes. And there are some species that have super many genes, particularly if you, for example, have, a, I don't know, imagine a hexaploid uh, assembly of a large plant, there will be a lot of genes in there. Um, okay, so what happens if you have too, too few genes? Well, there are some genomes where you have really few genes, as I said before. Um, but you can check whether any error occurred in the pipeline. You can check whether the Zebra run maybe um, discarded too much data and rerun Zebra enforcing a gene set. And as I said before, there is no way to know exactly how many genes to expect. You can look at relatives. I can tell you where I feel weird. I feel weird about more than 45 genes. That's when I check the relatives and I feel weird about less than 15,000. And then I also check like, is that normal for this kind of genome? If you have ISOSEC data, we have a link with instructions for you, um, but it doesn't always make the gene set better, um, but we try. <laughs> um, and if your Busco scores of the genome are higher than of your protein set, 
if the dis distance or difference is very small, it's okay. Then it's nothing to worry about. That happens. There are genes that sit in repeats that are found by Busco and they're not picked up by Breaker. That's okay. But if you see a big discrepancy, um, then maybe something is not so good with your output of Breaker and you might want to look into it. And then people sometimes, some say we're very friendly and take care of things. And some say we never reply to them. So um, we are a really small team. We have many things on our hands. We try to help you, but sometimes we cannot help you. And that's usually either because the problem is super hard to solve or because we didn't have time. So please bear with us. And um, whom to tell if you have a problem, GitHub issues are the way to go for us. Sending emails is kind of you, but I will usually ask you to put a GitHub issue because I have like about 1,500 unread emails. I'm never going to read them um, again. <laughs> okay, so that would be it from my side. Are there any more questions that you would like to have answered or comments? This is fabulous. Um, there is a question. Can we also use the pre-build Docker that's on Docker Hub? I'm assuming yes. Yes, absolutely. If you're academic user, please use uh, the Team Breaker Breaker 3 container. Amazing. Lots of people typing and saying it was very helpful. I agree. I love this. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you didn't fall asleep. I know that I did most of the talking, but that was to be expected in this session. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting to see if there are any more questions. People feel free to unmute if you want, uh, or I can stop the recording and then you know you might feel freer to unmute. Just one second. Thank you so much, Katharina. This was wonderful. And yeah, looking forward to the next one as well. Yeah, there is a question that I see. Um, it's interesting. The question is, is there any way using Breaker or other tools to use mass spec data as evidence for gene prediction? Um, yes, there is. Um, uh, so Breaker does accept um, hints that you prepare outside of Breaker. This is a not universal, like we do filter what kind of hints, but if you prepare it the right way, you can prepare externally a hints file from mass spec data. I've done that before. Uh, for example, for I think for Bombos Terrestris, we have a genome paper on Bombos Terrestris with a lot of great collaboration partners where this was done. Um, so this is possible. It's a lot of work and I'm not always convinced whether it's worth the effort, but if you have a lot of mass spec data for your genome, it might be because it gives really valuable reading frame information. On the other hand, um, when you do the peptide calling in mass spectrometry, you usually rely on a database in the back end um, that has to have the protein sequences like ahead of time, like ahead of the genome annotation process. Uh, so I'll tell you what we did with the Bombus terrestris. Um, I ran Augustus ab initio. You could also run it with hints, that doesn't matter. Um, but what I did is I switched on a flag of Augustus that uh, can sample alternative transcript isoforms without evidence. It's called, I think, alternatives from sampling or something like that. You can find it in the documentation. This generates a huge number of protein sequences from a eukaryotic genome that you trained Augustus for, for example, with Breaker. And then we use that for peptide identification and fed these peptides as hints back into gene prediction. So it is possible, but it's not like a pipeline that's standing on its own, including the spectra calling. Lots of people just saying thank you and that they had a great time and that people were terrified of annotation, but now they're not, which I think is like the best compliment ever. Thank you. That's so nice of you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording, but just stay on for a minute or two just in case there's anybody else.